Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Questions on British Muslim TV with me, Mohammed Shafiq. We're broadcasting Sky Channel 752 and across social media at British Muslim TV. Wherever you are joining us around the world, a very warm welcome to the program. Now, we want you to comment on the big stories we're covering tonight. You can call us on 01 924 231 083 or you can message us on the WhatsApp number which is on your screen. And if you're watching on Facebook, Post your comment and we will share them on air shortly. Let's give you the news updates from the last seven days. The United States President Joe Biden has said he does not regret his move to leave Afghanistan following 20 years of presence in the country. It comes as the Taliban have captured six more provincial capital cities, taking their total to nine out of 34 cities. President Biden speaking last night said they've got to fight for themselves, referring to the Afghan forces. Now, the Afghan government have had 20 years to prepare for this moment. They've had billions, if not trillions of dollars and military equipment, yet they are more interested in engaging in a propaganda battle against Pakistan. It is time for the excuses and diversion tactics to stop and the Afghan government to take responsibility for what is happening in their own country. Hundreds of British soldiers were killed in that country, and we must not forget the 70,000 Pakistanis killed for a war that spilled into Pakistan and that they were not responsible for. Last week, the British government announced that India, the UAE, Qatar and Bahrain would be put into the amber list, whilst Pakistan and Bangladesh will remain in the red list. This has obviously caused much anger in the British, Pakistani and Bengali communities as they both feel the decision was based on politics and economics and not science. Now, this is denied by the British government, who've said that their decision was based on science and data. The British High Commissioner in Pakistan, Christian Turner, reiterated this point yesterday. Now, the junior health minister, George Churchill, here in the UK, explained the reasons for keeping Pakistan on the red list of countries. He said uh, that the UK's Joint Biosecurity Centre continued to assess risk based on three factors, including incident trends in deaths and hospitalizations, exported, exported cases, as well as testing and test positivity rates across the country. Now, Asad Omar is the Pakistani cabinet minister responsible for COVID activity. He admitted at the weekend in a Zoom call with British parliamentarians that the Pakistani government did not share the data with the British government as it was easily available online. He promised that the Imran Khan government would connect with the British government about sharing the data and reshoring their concerns. Just on that, today, the Prime Minister's Special Advisor, the Pakistani Prime Minister's Special Advisor, uh, Dr. Faisal Sultan, has written uh, to the British Health Secretary, the English Health Secretary, Sajid Javid. Now, we were talking about the Pakistan remaining on the red list. The next review of the red list is expected around the 26th of August and Prime Minister Boris Johnson has promised to look at the data more closely. Now, Bolton South East MP Yasmin Qureshi has termed a move to keep Pakistan on the red list while downgrading India a clear and blatant discrimination towards Pakistan. And the Pakistani High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Mozam Ahmed Khan, on Tuesday addressing the media, said he was optimistic that the British government would remove Pakistan from the red list in the next review of August 26. He met Prime Minister Boris Johnson and made those representations at Sanders last Thursday. Now, we will keep an eye on this story in the coming weeks. Why? One, it's important to you, our views, but two, it's also important for me personally because I usually go to Pakistan in October um, and obviously keep an eye on that. So, obviously, if it's still in the red list, then we we'll, won't be going anywhere. Maybe going to Blackpool. Um, but anyway, in more positive news, in the UK, more than 75% of UK adults have now been double jabbed. That means they have had two doses of the vaccine. Prime Minister Boris Johnson described the milestone in the vaccine rollout as a huge national achievement. The Prime Minister hailed the incredible vaccine rollout and said it had provided vital protection against the virus for three quarters of adults. It's so important, he said, that those who haven't been vaccinated come forward as soon as possible to book their job, to protect themselves, protect their loved ones, and allow us all to enjoy our freedoms safely. Now, in other news, 
Amnesty International has said the Ethiopian military and its proxies are responsible for widespread sexual violence against women in the Tigray province. They said in a report that these constituted war crimes. The Ethiopian government have not responded to the allegations and report. It started when the Tigray, Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF, party stormed a military base after falling out with the Prime Minister over his political reforms. Now, in the first hour, we have an exclusive interview with a senior Liberal Democrat. Kamran Hussein is the chair of the Yorkshire Humber Liberal Democrats. He's a former parliamentary candidate. He reflects on his own personal journey and what now for the Liberal Democrats. Kamran joins us live shortly and will stay with us for the first hour. Then Dr. Kramat Iqbal from Birmingham joins us to discuss his report into the racist abuse suffered by taxi drivers and the impact on their own personal lives and communities. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us on 01 924 231 083 or messages on the social media handle British Muslim TV. Alternatively, you can send us a WhatsApp message. Yes, a WhatsApp message. The number is on your screen. The questions we're considering tonight. Do the Liberal Democrats have a future in British politics? Would you consider voting for the Liberal Democrats in the next general election? Or are the Liberal Democrats about to go extinct, extinct like dinosaurs did? Why is racist abuse of taxi drivers not given the same attention as other hate crimes? Please share your thoughts on 01924-231-083. Your messages on WhatsApp or post on social media. And we'll read some of your comments throughout the program. Now, let's start with our first guest and topic. In the peak of their power and influence, the Liberal Democrats were in government for five years, from 2010 to 2015, alongside the Conservative Party. In a subsequent general election, they lost over 40 seats and returned to the opposition benches. They've been accused of broken promises on austerity, public sector cuts, and who can forget the debacle over tuition fees? The Liberal Democrats say they had to make some tough decisions after the economic crisis of 2008 and put their country before their own party interests. Kamran Hussein is the chair of Yorkshire and Humble Liberal Democrats. He stood for the party in Leeds Northwest seat at the general election in 2019. He's married to Saba and is a lawyer 15 years standing. He runs the White Rose Blackman's Solicitors based in the constituency of Leeds Northwest. And for over 15 years, has been providing advice and assistance to the people of Leeds and beyond. Kamran Hussain lives in Kirklees and is joining us live from there. Kamran, a very warm welcome to the programme. Great to have you on. Thank you, Shafiq, and assalamu alaikum to all the viewers this evening. Um, 18 months into this pandemic, how are you and your family coping, sir? Well, as a family, we've quite coped um, OK, but it's been difficult. Um, not being able to see friends and family who've been in the hospital. Uh, my own father-in-law um, was in hospital for a number of weeks, uh, and under normal circumstances, we would have gone and visited him. But due to the COVID restrictions, we were unable to visit him. Likewise, um, sadly, during the pandemic, we've lost friends, family members, relatives, um, and sadly, given the restrictions that were in place, uh, we weren't able to go to the Janaza or pay our last respects. So in that regard, it's been a very tough uh, and difficult time. And our du'as are that we, we get through this quickly and we never have to return back to the days which we have seen. Yeah. And, and how is your professional life as a managing partner in a city law firm? How's that changed? How's your professional life changed? Well, in terms of the profession, we had to quickly adapt um, to not being able to see clients in person. Um, We've always been quite good in the sense that we've invested in systems which would allow us to see clients um, through um, programs such as Zoom uh, and Microsoft Teams. However, this moved this, everything quite quickly um, and we've had to adapt um, to that. Um, in addition to that, for example, in the family courts, um, the family courts were no longer operative and all of the hearings were done remotely. That in itself was quite challenging because when you are dealing with certain cases, it's very helpful sometimes to see the person um, in person in order to pick up their body language um, and not only what necessarily what comes out of their mouths. So we, we did adapt. Um, we were able to cope. Uh, but, but of course, it was a challenge at the time. Yeah. And uh, in a sense, what the pandemic has proven is that it doesn't affect productivity working at home. Have you started to think about how your firm's going to function after the pandemic ends and people 
sort of a hybrid option in terms of working from home and going to the office? Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. As a firm, we will continue to operate on the hybrid model. There are clients um, who can be dealt with remotely. There are staff in certain areas of work who can actually deal with work remotely. Um, and, and in those circumstances, they will be allowed to continue to work from home. But of course, there are other areas of work where um, needing to come to the office or attend the police station or attend in, in person in court um, is absolutely necessary. Um, so hybrid, um, I think, has to be the future. Um, in fact, um, productivity um, has increased because if you think about it in context, um, people have been able to save time in traveling uh, and have sometimes been able to commit that extra bit of time uh, to their clients and so forth. Yeah, and a real sense that we've, so many people, you refer to at the top of the, or top of the interview, so many people have lost loved ones uh, during this pandemic. What sort of lessons do you think we as a country can take from this pandemic? Well, I think one of the first things we, we must do, um, and this is a message for our young people, um, is to appreciate what we actually have. Um, I think what ends up happening is we, we take things for granted. Um, we don't give uh, the time, love um, and respect to our families, our, our, our generations. And I think the situation has taught us that you can lose loved ones quite quickly. Um, so when you do have time, make time, please. Um, spend it with your parents, spend it with your loved ones. Um, and don't take anything for granted. And there is a big world out there. Um, do what you can. Uh, but ultimately, just think about your futures as well. Yeah, because, you know, for, for a lawyer, would you assume you would have to have some sort of return back because you have to go to court and make representations, represent your clients. Um, do you think the government and Ministry of Justice needs to start looking at how you accept that sort of hybrid option? Well, in terms of it, it really depends on the type of work you deal with, because the bulk of the court cases um, ought to be done in person because you need to pick up that body language. Uh, but there are certain scenarios, there are certain types of matters. For yeah. example, if it's a straightforward procedural hearing. Cameron, just stay there. We're just going to take a very quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue our very important conversation with Cameron Hussein who's the chair of Yorkshire and humble Liberal Democrats. He's not going anywhere. I don't want you to go anywhere. John is on the other side of this. So I want to welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. Now, we're taking your calls on 01924 You can get in touch with us on our social media handle, which is British Muslim TV. Kamran Hussain, who's the chair of Yorkshire Humber Liberal Democrats, is my special guest tonight for this special interview. Now, um, Kamran, uh, let's get an insight into your upbringing. What was it like growing up? Well, it was a very open household. Uh, my father was a local councillor and the door was um, open pretty much most hours of the day. So we had lots of people who drop around the house uh, with issues. Um, so it was a very open um, environment where actually at a very young age, um, I met lots of people from all walks of life. Um, and of course, I was the first member of the family to attend university um, and, uh, and, and go on to graduate and become a solicitor. Yeah, because your father was a trendsetter. He was the first Liberal Democrat council elected in Kirklees, and he was the first Muslim Asian mayor. How proud is it for you to follow in his footsteps? Uh, absolutely, and it's even more proud when you, when you understand the background of my father. He came to this country at the tender age of 15, um, unable to speak a word of English, he tells me. Um, he went to the local factory, um, worked there like many of our elders did. Um, he then went to um, learn English at college and on the evenings, the weekend, um, and from there went on to work in the community. So when you, when you, when you put it in that context, um, it was a real achievement on his half, uh, behalf. Um, he, of course, is, is a hard worker. He's somebody who doesn't take no for an answer. Um, if he doesn't succeed the first time, he absolutely believes in trying again and again um, and until he's successful. But ultimately, his view always has been is, look, we need to put something back to the community. We need to do something to help other people who are less fortunate than we are. And I think the whole purpose of him being elected as a councillor was to help the communities, to ensure we can bring people together, but, but of course, deal with, with small and ordinary matters as well. 
Yeah, because uh, so politics, generally speaking, was a big part of your life growing up in your household. Um, it was, like I've said, when the door is open 24-7, in effect, um, you meet people from all walks of life. Uh, people come through the door with, with all sorts of problems and issues. Um, so politics from a very young age um, was something that we were involved with. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's about helping people. It's not just about politics. Politics is only effective if your aim is to help people. And I think that's what we were um, embedded to us um, at a very young age. Yeah. And your father was the head of the Racial Equality Council as well. So fighting racism was his calling too as well? Well, I don't think it was just racism. I, I know he was a member of the Kirklees Racial Equality Council at the, at the time. But of course, any form of discrimination. Um, my father's the type of person who wants to bring communities together, uh, build bridges and not walls. And now racial um, discrimination was one of those factors that he was absolutely not going to stand for. Um, and similarly, any form of discrimination should never be tolerated. Uh, and my father was one of the first to say, look, um, if you if you want to stand for something, you've got to actually do the work. Uh, there is very little point um, shouting at the TV or uh, making comments um, here, there, and everywhere. But you've got to be um, effectively working in the community to eradicate problems. Mm. Okay, let, let, we, that's a really good uh, introduction to you, Cameron. But let's start off on our political journey. Why are you a Liberal Democrat? Because ultimately, I believe in freedoms, um, freedom of the individual um, to live their life in the manner that they want to live in. Um, I believe in bringing power back to communities um, at the lowest possible level. Um, I want a strong democracy. Um, I want people um, to build bridges um, and not simply walls. Uh, and I don't believe that anybody um, should suffer from conformity, i.e. we shouldn't be telling people, we shouldn't be dictating to people uh, how uh, or what they can achieve in life. So when young children are born, we should be shouting proudly and saying to the children, the world is your oyster. Live the life the way you want to live it within reason. Uh, and of course, go on and achieve um, anything you want to achieve. Uh, and any form of discrimination, whatever form that it may be, should never and can never be tolerated. Yeah, and, and then the, you, I I'm surely rightly ask you this question, that the sort of struggle you get with the Liberal Democrats, you have a good contingent representation in, 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 in southern England, or you used to have, so they would generally tend to be the economic liberals versus the social liberals who were more populated in sort of the northern constituencies. And does that still divide within the Liberal Democrats exist? Well, well, I think with the Liberal Democrats, we certainly are showing that, that we're on our way back. Um, the, the election results in Cheshire and Amersham showed people that the Liberal Democrats can actually win. Um, so it, it's about um, having that belief that if we continue to work away, if we continue to chip away, then we can achieve what we want to achieve, and that is to um, bring back power back to um, the local level as far as possible uh, to really um, galvanize local communities and to bring back street politics. I think a lot of times what ends up happening, whichever spectrum you're in, um, there's all this talk about national politics, but people forget there are simple issues on the doorstep that need addressing as well. Yeah, and where do you sit on that wing? It's a bit like, you know, are you on the right? Are you on the left? Are you in the middle? Well, I'm a liberal and liberal throughout. I believe in freedoms. Um, I don't believe in this left and right. I think as liberals, we want to give people that, that opportunity. Um, we may slightly differ on views, but that's absolutely fine. There's, there's no harm in having different uh, discussions, different viewpoints of matters, but certainly as liberals, we learn to respect um, each other's differences. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm th I, I seem to have lost you in my ear, but we'll, just, we'll, we'll persevere and, and ca I carry on in terms of asking you, Cameron, uh, what sort of values, when you look at the Liberal Democrats, the principles, would you identify with as a, as a proud Muslim? Well, you've got the, um, in terms of, for example, the Liberal Democrats have always believed um, in human rights. Now, the ongoings in Kashmir and, uh, and Palestine are two examples where Liberals stand up for these individuals. Um, in Kashmir, you know yourself, um, it's been too long, far too long, where um, ordinary Kashmiris um, have been um, had their civil liberties withheld from them, and that shouldn't be happening. Similarly, many young children um, 
uh, and others have lost their lives in Palestine. And until we recognize a two state solution, um, you cannot achieve long standing peace. So these are the kind of international examples that the Liberal Democrats stand for. It's about going back to your basic principle about freedoms, mm. human rights, and ensuring people can live their lives um, in the manner that they want to live their lives in. And if we continue to believe that as liberals, these are the campaigns we're actually fighting for internationally. Yeah. And do, do you think that when you talk about human rights, you talk about civil liberties, and these are issues on which many Muslims could identify themselves with? Uh, absolutely. I, I don't think there's um, many Muslims um, around the world who will say, well, look, um, we don't want uh, Palestine to be free. We don't want Kashmir to be free. Um, you know, human rights abuses should never be tolerated. That is a fundamental thing that goes against liberal values. And I certainly will not tolerate the day when people are dictated upon in that manner. Yeah, um, we're coming close to the break. And I just wanted to think about when you look at some of those dinosaurs who have, uh, you know, been there for the Liberal Democrats these many, many years, Paddy Ashdown, Nick Clegg, Simon Hughes, you know, Lord Malcolm, Bruce, Charles Kennedy, uh, lots of them who've obviously sadly passed away as well. Who do you look to as a sort of a Liberal Democrat hero? There's, there's actually quite a few. I think you've named Charles Kennedy is one of them, Liberal Democrats, who I was actually fortunate uh, to meet quite regularly. Um, Paddy Ashton was a great liberal hero. Um, we've then got the likes of Sir Ed Davey, um, Leila Moran, who, uh, the, the former Leila Moran, who has passionately uh, spoken out on Palestine, um, who is of a Palestinian descent. Um, so the, we've actually quite privileged, we've got quite a few within the party, um, and some sadly have lost their lives, the likes of Charles Kennedy, Paddy Ashton, who are no longer with us. But ultimately, we've got people who are actual real fighters, who want to fight for liberal values, and to ensure those freedoms that we believe in, um, and not only dealt with here nationally and uh, locally, but also internationally as well. Yeah, and, and a real sense of these people who've been part of our national political life for many, many years, obviously no longer here. You think about Paddy Ashdown, you think about Charles Kennedy, um, uh, and, and really uh, missed, if you like, in our national politics. Because in a sense, you can be from a, whatever political persuasion, um, but you can appreciate the likes of Charles Kennedy or Tony Benn, for example, um, um, and other people from different spectrums of political life in this country. Yeah. There's certainly many great individuals uh, across across the political spectrum. Um, they don't have to be Liberal Democrats as such. There are many Liberals uh, with a small L Liberals um, in other political parties. Um, and in the in just before the last election, you saw some of those small L liberals come across to the Liberal Democrats as a party of the future. So I don't think it's just the Liberals that have got great politicians. I think there's every political party has some great uh, politicians. But certainly the Liberal Democrats, we've been quite lucky that we've got many of them um, that continue to serve to the day. Yeah, uh, but lots of those Liberal voters deserted you in 2019. They, they went over to the Conservatives because they wanted Brexit done. Um, what would you say about that? Well, there was the issue about should we get Brexit done, um, and Boris Johnson and many others made uh, lots of promises which were simply undeliverable, um, and time will tell. Uh, currently, um, they are using COVID uh, as a means of covering up many of the issues that are arising, but of course, with going beyond COVID, you will see the impact of Brexit. Uh, I'm sorry, but Brexit will not be good for this country. Uh, we may have got Brexit done, but the implications will be with us, and not only for us, but for our future generations, because what you've ultimately done is cut ourselves off from our friends and family um, and our closest allies in mainland Europe. Um, and the world is such at the moment that we cannot uh, deal with many issues on our own. Take climate emergency, for example. Mm -hmm. The UK cannot deal with it on its own. We need to be working with our colleagues uh, and partners, not only in Europe, but uh, across the world. Um, other issues like international crime, uh, terrorism and so forth require a sense of cooperation and working together to ensure that we can deal with them effectively. But there's a small number of people within the Liberal Democrats who would argue that your obsession with a second referendum and a return back into the European Union cost you seats and cost you votes at the last general election? Well, in terms of the second referendum, what we simply said was we would allow the, the government to negotiate a deal. The government came back with the deal, um, and it was putting that deal to the people to decide whether that deal was good enough or not. Mm. 
Because you've got to remember back in 2016, many, many false promises were made. You talked about the £350 million uh, for the NHS, the, the, the big red double-decker bus, which miraculously disappeared straight after the referendum. There were many other promises made by, by the likes of our current Prime Minister and, and others for political gains. Now, when you have those promises and people actually wore themselves on those promises, then they ultimately should put it back yeah, to the people. Okay. Look, is yeah. this what you actually voted for? Yeah, well, we're going to pause there. We're going to take a very quick break. It's a very quick break. We don't expect you to go anywhere. Keep sitting on your seat. Listen to some very important messages. And when we come back, we continue the important conversation with Kamran Hussain. Join us on the other side of these important messages. I'm glad you didn't go anywhere. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We're taking your calls on 01924231083. You can get in touch with us on our social media handle, British Muslim TV. Now, we're continuing our reflections with our very special guest, Kamran Hussain, who's still with us. Now, before the break, you told us about why you were a Liberal Democrat. Now, let's look at that period. First time in, what, 70, 80 years? Your party, your successor party, to this term, the successor party, the Liberal Party, but the Liberal Democrats, you were in government in 2010 uh, and 15. When you look back at that five years, what are you proud of in terms of the policies delivered by the Liberal Democrats? I'm glad you asked that question, and I hope you've got quite a bit of time for me to answer that, because there is actually quite a lot what we achieved um, during that period um, of government. For example, we took over 3 million people um, from the lowest um, earners out of paying income tax. Um, we created the world's first national green investment bank, bank um, which uh, has backed many green infrastructure projects. Um, we invested in our young people by creating 2 million apprenticeships. Um, we implemented the pupil premium, which gives schools extra money to help disadvantaged children. Uh, we restored links between pensions and earnings. Um, we reformed the banks, protected post offices. We built uh, oh, just over 190,000 new affordable homes and brought old homes back into use. Um, we asked many plans um, which were in place uh, to, to go after civil liberties. For example, the ID scheme was uh, scrapped. Uh, we believed in stopping routine uh, detention of young children mm. uh, in immigration cases. And we stopped government um, holding on to DNA um, of innocent people. So there's actually a lot we achieved yeah. uh, in that period. Now, I, I've really given you a good run uh, there, and I wanted to give you that time because you asked for that so nicely, Cameron. Let's talk. Let's switch it then. What did the party get wrong? We, we, I think one of the things we actually did get wrong um, was we were not very good at telling people what we actually did achieve in government. Um, we allowed the Tories, um, through possibly their friends um, in the media, um, to claim credit for a lot of the Liberal Democrat policies. Uh, and of course, we put our hands up and we, we did not do right um, in the student fees debacle. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to mince my words on this. It was wrong. Uh, but of course, when you are in a coalition, sometimes you, things have to give the other way. It's, yeah. it's almost like a marriage where um, you don't always get your... But, your but, but the sense with the tuition fees, sorry, raking over the past, but was that the coalition agreement that you signed allowed you to abstain, yet your party decided to vote for the policy, and that was why it was people were so angry with you. Well, I, I was one of those people who um, has always campaigned against student fees. Um, you've got to bring it back into context. This was student fees that was introduced by a Labour government who were not in a coalition. Um, in 1997, you had Tony Blair, the then Prime Minister, talk about education, education, education. And one of the first things he did in 1998 was open the door um, for tuition fees. So when you've opened the door, um, I think it was something that was difficult to hold on to. Um, and it did allow... Um, the government at the time, sadly, to, to open that door even further. Yeah. Um, and in a real sense, you look at austerity, you look at the policies which you backed up uh, in those five years. Communities were decimated and you paid a heavy price for that at the ballot box. Not because, <laughs> not because, you know, the Tories, people kind of, you know, expect the Tories, if you like, to do those things, but they never expected the Liberal Democrats, which pitched themselves as a centre-left party, 
to do that to working class communities. These were difficult times. Um, at the outset, you'll, you'll remember um, the former Labour minister in, in 2010 leaving a note to say there simply isn't any money left. This was after 12 years of a majority, well, a government, a Labour government who kept on winning with landslides. But of course, the Liberal Democrats coming into power actually did a lot to help young uh, people. I talk about affordable homes. I talk about people premium. Um, and then we also talk about taking people out of the in income tax threshold. So there's actually a lot we achieved in trying to help disadvantaged people. But of course, people sometimes forget um, what you actually do. It's what you don't achieve um, that is more remembered at times. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's always, it's always the case in politics. People remember uh, all the uh, things. But you, you think it's also fair to talk about um, you helped the process of the Brexit referendum that you were so against. You helped that process because in 2009, Ed Davey, who's now your leader at the time, was the spokesman on, on this issue in the House of Commons, campaigned for an in-out referendum in 2009. And when David Cameron delivered it, what, seven years later, we had Brexit. I think one thing you can't accuse really of the Liberal Democrats is um, assisting Brexit. We've always been passionate uh, Remainers, passionate internationalists. But you were in favour of an in-out referendum in 2009, well, it, and that remained your policy up until the 2010 election. It was a policy that was over a decade ago, um, and it was not a policy that was very light within, within our membership. Um, moving forward, it, it was something that the Conservatives wanted to do. David Cameron had had a real dilemma within his part, Conservative Party. Um, he had the those Brexiteers and Remainers within his party. And he thought um, the only way to unite the country was, and unite the Conservative Party more than anything, was to hold this referendum. Now, Liberal Democrats have always, and were very vocal um, on remaining in the European Union. We were very passionate, and I, um, as the regional chairperson for the Remain campaign for the Liberal Democrats, was very vocal on this issue. Mm. Sadly, you had the Conservative Party who was bitterly divided. Then you have Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party who sat on the fence because even Labour supporters and members were not clear what their policy was. And had Labour Party come out passionately for Remain, then we would not have had the Brexit. It, it's quite simply that. Well, we, were, we wanted to open the lines, and I often get camera and I get accused of not... Um... Uh, not entertaining callers, but I just get so consumed by my guests, I totally forget we have callers waiting. So let's go to the first uh, caller of the evening. Let's go to line one. Salaam alaikum. You're live on British Muslim TV. Wa alaikum as salam. Wa rahmatullah. Wa How are you doing, Akhi? I'm good. Welcome to the programme, my dear brother. Um, Liberal Democrats was a party that back in the day when uh, I was a student really used to um, have a lot of hope for until you actually came in um, government. So some of your views... Um, are kind of like troublesome, especially for the Muslim community. I mean, claim to be liberal Democrats. I just wanted to know your guest views. Um, when they were in government, they had a uh, minister, Jeremy Brown, who proposed actually banning the uh, Muslim women from wearing the uh, niqab. Uh, it's just disturbing to know when you actually get the power to actually do things, uh, the liberalism seems to become illiberal. So I wanted to share... Uh, find out from him his views about that incident and what he actually thinks what the Liberal Talking Democrats about, uh, uh, mean uh, to the Muslims. Jeremy Brown, who is the MP for Winchester, and he was also the Foreign Office Minister, yeah. Home um, Secretary, yeah. It, yeah, it was, it was, no, you're right, he was the junior minister in uh, the Home Office at that time. OK, um, but yeah, Jeremy, uh, Jer Jeremy Brown. Well, Cameron, there was that distinct issue that the Liberal Democrats suffered, not just... Um, because of what was happening in tuition fees and others, but also because of things like that. In terms of Liberal Democrats, we've, we've obviously got different views. Um, and as Liberals within the party, we often dis disagree. My view uh, and the view of many others is that if you can wear the dress, uh, for example, if you can wear a miniskirt, then what, what is there stopping you wearing a niqab? Now, I don't know if you recall many, many years ago, there was an incident um, at one of the Thornhill schools where um, a niqab in teacher was quite criticised. My father was a local councillor at the time and stood passionately with that teacher to say, look, if you are allowing people to wear any forms of other dresses, then you should not be preventing people um, people um, wearing a niqab, um, which, which is something fundamental to many Muslims around the world. Yeah, this is... Uh... Caused lots of controversy in 2000, uh, um, 
Bertin, I think it was, uh, in the run-up to your party conference, um, where he said that the uh, conference in Glasgow uh, was actually about the party having a debate about changing the law to stop people from being forced to wear the niqab. Well, well, like I've just said, um, I'm... Yeah, because he wasn't, he wasn't the first. Sorry, Cameron, he wasn't the first. You had David Ward, who was your former MP in Bradford East, saying something similar, that he was instinctively opposed to the niqab. So you had white middle-class men telling women how to dress. That shouldn't be happening. We have got no right um, in telling other people how they dress. And, and when you look at fundamental liberal values, it's about allowing people to live their lives um, in the manner that they want to live in. And when any cop, um, it should be allowed. And, and I certainly would not tolerate a situation, or at least I would certainly go up and argue against that point. Yeah. I don't think we can agree with every policy. I don't think any politician would come here uh, on your show on any issue and say, you're right. I want to yeah. agree with every policy of my political party because there are policies um, which we disagree with. There are views of individuals, and if David Ward and others have taken that view, that is something I fundamentally disagree with. OK. Um, let's just quickly move on. But because your party was kind of a strange 2019, you had... The European parliamentary elections, which you got absolute huge number of votes and lots and lots of seats in the European Parliament. And then you got loads of seats in the local elections as well that same year. But then when the general election happened in December 2019, you only ended up with 12 seats. Um, and you kind of ran a campaign which was based about, you know, Joe Swinson becoming the next prime minister and you were going to stop Brexit when everybody wanted Brexit just to be done and dusted. Well, in terms of the European elections, you're absolutely right in pointing out we did extremely well. Uh, we elected um, many uh, MEPs in the, here in the Yorkshire and Humber. My colleague Shafak Mohammed um, was elected as a member of the European Parliament. We did extremely well um, in the local elections. But of course, that support didn't carry through um, into the general election. There are a number of reasons for that. And one of the reasons um, was our policy on rework. Um, which is something I do, didn't agree with at the time, and I don't think ought to have happened, but I couldn't understand the reasoning behind it. Um, it, it. The reason was if we ended up in government, then people surely want to stop Brexit, and you wanted to give that people the opportunity to vote for it in that particular manner. But of course, there were other underlying factors. For example, there were people who were extremely concerned um, with Jeremy Corbyn becoming a prime minister, um, and that was preventing them voting for anybody else apart from yeah. the Conservative Party. And likewise, on the other side, there were people who were extremely concerned about... You were, just, you were just too pro-Remain. You're going to be honest tonight and say, yeah, that's the case. We, we are very honest. We've always been pro-Remain. Um, and I, I think credit where credit is due, we, we, we didn't want to tell people what they want to hear. We wanted to tell them what we actually stood for. And we, we, we're passionate about Europe. Yeah. We're passionate about working with our colleagues around the world. Because I, like I said a few moments ago, there are issues that we need to deal with um, together, whether it's terrorism, whether it's international crime um, or, or climate emergency. We cannot deal with these issues alone. And we cannot cut off ourselves uh, from the rest of the world. Yeah. And, okay. and of course, we've had opportunities. Um, I, myself and yourself and others have grown up with... Yeah, we're, gonna, we're just going to pause there. Sorry to interrupt you again, Cameron. We've got a very quick break. Uh, nobody's going to, going to go anywhere. We're going to stay here. We're going to wait and we'll come back and we'll carry on the conversation. But Cameron is saying on the other side of this. Welcome back to Questions. Yes, I know you didn't go anywhere, but welcome back anyway. Uh, Cameron Hussein hasn't gone anywhere. He's been at the hot seat uh, taking these difficult and tough questions. But uh, we're always grateful to get an insight into our leading politicians and senior people in our political life. Now, you were the candidate uh, in that election we were talking about before the break in 2019. You were in Leeds Northwest. Uh, this was a seat that your party held for 12 years. Uh, Greg Mulholland, um, my good friend, um, how was that campaign for you? Because you, you kind of, you're in a Euro campaign, you do spectacular well, you get, what, loads and loads of MEPs, you then get loads of council seats as well, so you're doing particularly well, you're really enthusiastic and you come into this campaign. How are you feeling during this campaign? 
It's an interesting campaign. Um, up to 2017, we held that seat. Uh, and sadly, we lost Greg Mulholland in 2017 to the Labour Party. It's one of those campaigns. Um, there's a lot of um, isms involved. Um, there were people who, who were quite open and said, look, you're not one of us. We cannot vote for you. There were other people who absolutely hated um, Joe Swinson. Um, and there were Liberal Democrat voters who wanted to leave the European Union. So there was a number of factors um, when, you, when you put in that context. And then, of course, you had this scenario where people were absolutely adamant that they didn't want Boris Johnson um, anywhere near number 10. Um, and we're going to vote Labour because they saw Labour as the only way to keep Boris Johnson out of number 10. And likewise, on the other side, you had people who were adamant that they, want, they didn't want Jeremy Corbyn anywhere near number 10. And again, we're going to vote Conservative uh, to ensure that, you know, that, that could take place. So I think, in a nutshell, we got squeezed in the middle. Mm, you got squeezed. Um, and then, it, it sort of in Leeds North West, your, your, the Lib Dem share of the vote went down by 15.6%. Is that what you put it down to, the fact that Lots of people who wanted Brexit done voted for Boris Johnson. And there were some people who just couldn't fathom the idea of Jeremy Corbyn being prime minister and decided to either stay at home or to vote for the Conservatives. Sadly, those were two reasons. Um, the, the Tory party vote actually increased in, in that election. Yes, it is, um, yeah. And it, there was no clear reason for it to happen. Because actually, sorry, you do, you, your campaign by journalists around the country, people who've been to Leeds Northwest described it as a high-energy campaign that was resonating with voters. I think we were doing quite well um, in the campaign, to the build-up to the campaign. But, of course, when we got near at the time, um, people, some people were put off by Joe Swinson, some people were put off by yeah. this idea of um, stopping Brexit. Um, there are some people who just at the last minute so well, if Jeremy Corbyn is going to get anywhere near number 10, we've got to stop him. And in their view, by voting the Conservatives, that was the way to stop him. Um, and similarly, there were people who said, look, we'll vote Labour. Uh, because but it could don't... possibly also be a vote against your party. I think, I think in terms of our party, the only policy that some people found um, not attractive, if I can put it in that particular manner, was this idea about us trying to stop Brexit. Um, we'd always campaigned for a second uh, referendum, a people's vote, um, but there were people within the Liberal Democrats, uh, our own, some of our own members, um, who were very open that they had water leave and just really wanted to get Brexit done and move on without understanding the real consequence that Brexit wasn't going to end sooner um, as anticipated. Um, and, and when you assess the Liberal Democrat record in your region, where you are the chair here in Yorkshire and Humberside, how do you, uh, how do you assess your record as a party? Because you lost Bradford East uh, in those years uh, while you were in government, um, in the general election in 2015. Uh, you lost Sheffield Hallam. You lost Leeds Northwest. Did you win anything in Yorkshire? Well, in terms of, um, you're absolutely right, we did lose them three seats in the 2015 and 2017 elections. Um, a lot of that was the backdrop from um, the upset from the coalition years. Uh, but certainly, um, come 2019, we, we, we did well. We um, gained um, Shafat Mohammed. We sent Shafat Mohammed to the European Parliament. We gained um, in the local council seats. And if you look at the local um, election results since, uh, 2019, you'll see there's been games in places like Sheffield and Hull. Uh, we've done extremely well in places like Rotherham and Barnsley, and we've even gained a council in, uh, in Wakefield. And our watch share is going back to where it ought to be. Of course, it will take time, and the real test will be the next general election, where we will have an opportunity to elect Member of Parliament to have uh, representation on a national level in our region again. Yeah, and a real sense of when you look at the region, you look at the mayoral election that you recently had, you had a really strong candidate um, there, but you also had the by-election in Batley and Spen, again, a very strong candidate, Wakefield councillor there. Uh, how do you assess uh, where the Liberal Democrats are as we head towards this general election that might come in 2023 20, or 2024? Well, I think in terms of the Batley and Spen by-election, there was a real... Um, tactical vote um, that took place. Um, I think your channel covered many of the issues um, that arose uh, on the doorstep. You had a, a Labour Party who had taken um, 
one section of the community's war for granted for far too long, and one of the other candidates was able to expose that. You had a conservative candidate um, who was extremely arrogant and who um, I think failed to attend one of your debates. Um, he was so confident of winning um, that he, he ignored um, many of the voters. He simply refused to campaign because all he saw was, I'm going to win. So I think there was tactical voting that took place um, in the election. But similarly in Cheshire and Amisham, um, the conservative um, had never lost that seat for many years. Um, and, and the Liberal Democrats were able to turn over a massive majority to gain that seat. And, and Labour, what they found themselves, many Labour voters actually voted the Liberal Democrats because they wanted to get rid of the Conservative mm. vote. So, so I think there's actually going to be a shift in politics um, in terms of people are going to be thinking as to who can we vote to get rid of the other political party. And, and as we come towards the end of the interview, uh, wh where do you think uh, the Liberal Democrats will stand after the next general election? I think we will certainly gain many seats. Um, there are many um, Tory MPs who've, um, since Cheshire and Amisham um, by-election, are really scratching their head thinking, are we next? There are many seats where the Liberal Democrats are in a strong um, second position where we can gain those seats and have a real impact um, nationally. But of course, it's not only There's 92 the seats in England where the Liberal Democrats are second to the Conservatives and yeah. many would see as the alternative to the Labour Party uh, in the North, where they're second? Well, I, th I think the Labour Party, there are many in the, within the Labour Party who understand that a success for the Liberal Democrats can, can help them in the future. Um, you've got this Conservative government at the moment who've done some absolutely crazy things um, and have simply been allowed to get away with it. So we need an effective opposition within Parliament and outside of Parliament to ensure that we can hold governments to account because when you don't have an effective opposition, then things can happen. Um, policies could be implemented, which are simply not good for anybody, and people are then left scratching their heads as to how a policy was implemented. Yeah, and where, do you, where, where, does, uh, where does your future lie? I mean, you've certainly fought your first parliamentary election uh, in Leeds North West. Where, where, where to next? Well, I've always believed in helping people, um, communities across, um, across constituency, across um, everywhere, really. So um, in terms of where my future lies, well, it's um, early days. Um, I like to think I'm quite young, quite active, uh, and you'll soon see me standing somewhere very soon. Yeah, well, um, uh, as they say, you might be knocking on the door next to one of our viewers. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and blessing us with your presence. Uh, I know the work that our politicians at times get accused of not doing the work, but uh, you know what the Liberal Democrats are known for? Our pavement politics, knocking doors and delivering leaflets. And um, I, I know you are appreciated and respected in your constituency and your community. So thank you so much for being our guest and uh, keep safe and uh, love to the family. Thank you very much, Abhi. Thank you. And that was Cameron Hussein, who was the chair of the Liberal Democrats in Yorkshire and Humberside, uh, joining us live there from Kirklees. Um, and he was also the former parliamentary candidate in Leeds North West. Now, lots of conversation. At the top of the programme, we talked about Pakistan being in the red list. And we had this extraordinary situation where the British government accused the Pakistan government of not sharing its coronavirus data. And that's why they had made a decision to leave Pakistan in the red list. Now, on Saturday, that was what the ministers... Sorry, let me recollect that. That's what the government was briefing journalists like me that it was the Pakistani government that didn't share that data. Asad Umar, I talked about him earlier, who's the Pakistan cabinet minister in charge of COVID recovery and activity in Pakistan, admitted in a meeting with British parliamentarians that they did indeed not share that data because that data was widely available on the internet. You would think that a Pakistani government would have had a conversation and a relationship or a dialogue to understand the needs of British authorities um, and provide that data. You would assume that. Now, the Pakistani government is saying that the British government is using that as an excuse because there is no justification for leaving Pakistan on the red list. We have the United States of America, our closest ally and friend, where cases this week have topped 100,000 per day. Yet, yeah, we don't have the United States 
in a red list. We have India, from where the original Delta variant originated from, which the government took three weeks in which the virus, the variant, spread across the United Kingdom before they decided to close the border and put India on the red list. That was three years. That was three weeks, my apologies. And so if you're going to have a consistent policy to identify whether it's safe for Pakistan to come, Pakistanis to come back to the UK, that the testing is done and that every country around the world is treated the same. And it's that inconsistency that when you think about the British government and its announcements, that doesn't really stand up. The inconsistencies around the way decisions were made about Pakistan was completely different to the decisions that would be made about the other countries. You look at the spread of cases in the United Arab Emirates, in Qatar, which are huge international hubs where people uh, fly into to fly back out. And those level of cases are still there. And so, yeah, we need to think about really clearly what is going on. One, that the Pakistan government should really be talking to the British government. It's common sense. If your citizens are stranded in a country where you want to reopen that travel corridor, you would talk to the British government. You wouldn't wait for the British government to contact you. You'd be proactive. And I just think that the attacks against the British government and ministers that we've seen from Pakistan cabinet ministers is not the way forward. We'll keep an eye on the story. After the break, we head to Birmingham. Talk to Dr. Kramat who, uh, Iqbal about his report into the experiences of British Muslims who've been racially abused. We'll take a very quick break. I'll get a glass of water and then we'll see you on the other side of these important messages. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. It feels like I've been on camera all day, but it's only been an hour. It's amazing what happens when you enjoy yourself and you find your guest uh, strengthening your knowledge, not just on politics, uh, but other issues. Now, let's move on to our final topic for the program. A shocking report has found that Asian and black taxi drivers across the United Kingdom are racially abused every single day. Some are punched, scratched and threatened in what drivers have called an unacceptable level of abuse. During this pandemic, they have been on the front line. They have been the key workers keeping the country moving, making important deliveries and getting key workers to their workplaces. Now, the author of the report, Dr. Karamat Iqbal, has found a third of drivers have said that they've experienced abuse at least once a week but didn't report it, as they felt nothing, as they felt nothing would ever be done. Dr. Karamat Iqbal has worked in equalities and education over the past 40 years I'm really pleased and excited he's joining us live from Birmingham. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me time on your uh, uh, key program for the Thank community. You. Well, it's a the privilege is all ours, sir. Tell us, how are you and the family coping during this pandemic? Uh, thanks to God, we, we're doing well. Thank you. And... Um, um, everybody's okay. How how are you and your family? All good, thank you. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been strange, um, but like you said, it's a it's a blessing that we are still here, and we've got to got to the other side. We've got the vaccination, and that's really great. I love the way you switched that question onto me. Um, that's great. So tell <laughs> us, uh, tell us, uh, what pushed you to research the racial abuse of taxi if drivers? You, if, if you let me, I'll be interviewing you. Yeah, we could switch uh, roles. <laughs> Okay, um, how, um, how I began with the uh, taxi driver uh, research, it was a, a Thursday evening, 4th of June, 2020. I was uh, having my evening meal and uh, minding my own business, uh, watching uh, Midlands Today. And um, I saw a fellow white citizen 
abusing a fellow brown citizen. Um, the brown citizen was a taxi driver, white citizen was a passenger. And um, to be honest with you, I was appalled mm. with what I saw. Because I, I, I actually, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Uh, Iqbal. Yeah. I found reading the report depressing. But you know what shocked me more? Was the acceptance, the casual acceptance of that racial abuse, where at times you look at, uh, which at times turned physical, because drivers felt they just wouldn't get justice. That's what shocked me more, yes. not the racism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I... Um... Um, you know, just just got up. I, I was appalled and I was angry. And um, but you know, I'm an academic. I'm in education. Um, I've got numerous qualifications. When I'm angry, when I'm appalled, I I use my head rather than my heart. Yeah. Uh, obviously, my heart guides it, but my head uh, gives me the intellect to find ways of doing something about it without shouting and screaming. Um, and so I um, uh, decided there and then that I would research the problem. In fact, the Midlands Today program I was watching finished at seven o'clock. By seven minutes to seven, I had already sent a text to a local taxi driver uh, in the trade and said to him, I was going to research this problem. Yeah. And there and then I set out to research and speak to people and gather the data. And it took me about a year of my own time and uh, uh, to research it. And I stuck with it. And now the report is out. Yeah. And can you give us a few examples of what those drivers were telling you about what they were subjected to? I think the, the first thing that I found, which was really confirming what somebody had told me, that racist abuse was normal. It was something they took for granted as drivers and were almost expecting it every day. And the kind of abuse involved being told to go home, meaning go to another country. When many of these drivers are actually British born, people would be called, you know, drivers would be called the N word, uh, the P word, called a terrorist. And after Brexit, the abuse has got worse. And it's not just words. Drivers are attacked. Their car is damaged and the passenger may not pay and do a runner. So those are some of the things mm. that were going on. And this happens regularly, every day, almost as normal. Yeah, and you found that racial abuse was normal for 83% of the drivers who responded to your survey. We did over a third of them saying they'd experienced hate incidents at least once a week. Now, how does that sit across the country? Is it a similar pattern across the country? Yes, my, my, I decided that I would send out a survey uh, which was completed by over um, uh, nearly 300 people. And uh, it is a survey of drivers across the country, North, South, Midlands, East, West, uh, wherever um, there are drivers. And remember, 25% of Pakistani males are employed in the taxi trade. So there are certain communities that are more likely to be in the taxi trade. And so they are more likely to be abused. But the pattern of abuse was national and the same. And I think there, there is a slight difference in that in major urban areas, there are more minority drivers to support each other. But I think the problem for isolated drivers in isolated minority communities 
in maybe rural areas of the country, um, the problem is the same, but how they deal with it, how they are able to cope with it, who they turn to um, is, is worse. And, and do you sense that the sample of people that you spoke to was, was widely representative of that rural urban divide? Yes, it was, yes. There, are, there, there were more people from the urban, urban centers of population, but we, we did have a, a, a fair selection of rural drivers. And um, so this would be a national sample of drivers, majority of whom were abused, and a majority of those who were abused were from ethnic minorities. And there were particular types of abuse, which was directed, for example, at Muslim uh, drivers, um, who, who would then, you know, uh, be abused uh, for having a, maybe a beard or, or some other way uh, that, that it was suspected that they would be Muslim, and then they would be called terrorists and um, those kinds of things. Yeah, in, in some parts of the country where there uh, was child sexual ex exploitation gangs, they were called groomers um, and, yes. and other profanities. Yeah, really experience. And what's interesting about this report uh, is that for you, our viewers, it's based on real testimonies, re real evidence from drivers up and down the country. Uh, Dr. Karamat, um, Iqbal is going to be staying with us. We'll learn more about the report. Now, the report only, uh, the report found only uh, a handful of drivers actually reported their abuse and attacks, at times physical, uh, to the police. Why do you think uh, reporting is so low, uh, Dr. Iqbal? The drivers um, are experienced people. They have been abused for many years. And they know that when they when they take the time out to report it, um, they, it takes time away from their work. And when they report it and nothing is done, and sometimes the drivers themselves may end up being accused or maybe deprived of uh, custom and uh, taken off particular rotors or particular passengers. So the drivers think, well, we're actually losing rather than gaining. Nothing is going to be done. Uh, so they don't bother reporting. Yeah. Um, and now some of the drivers I've spoken to have said the licensing the departments in councils are well known for the heavy policing of the taxi licensing trade, going out, checking cars, checking and not applying for hire, making uh, those sort of draconian checks and uh, on drivers and their vehicles. And we know of one case, which I know of, where a taxi driver was attacked, he had a bottle smashed over his head, and for four months, five months, didn't receive a single call, uh, a single email from the licensing department to check up if he was okay. Um, very little help and support for victims. Did you find that in the report as well? Yes, there are plenty of um, examples. Remember, I, I did my... Uh, survey um, a questionnaire uh, and also I interviewed a number of drivers so, so there are personal uh, testimonies uh, in the report and um, uh, it's quite an appalling state of affairs that has to be addressed by the authorities. Yeah and you've said you've claimed uh, the stage has been set for racism to flourish against taxi drivers. Why do you think that is? Well, there are a number of uh, reasons. Uh, the drivers work on their own. Uh, so they're, they're what I would call lone workers. They are vulnerable. We also have, a as a society, um, have a particularly low... Uh, attitude towards service providers and uh, those in uh, uh, low paid jobs, frontline jobs. We'll take some comments and questions from you on the number 01924 231 083.
We'll take a very quick final break. Yes, it's the final countdown to the end of the program. Not that I'm getting excited. I love my program. I love being on screen. Um, but we'll take a very quick break and we'll continue the conversation with Dr. Iqbal on the other side of this. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. It's the final segment of the programme tonight. Dr. Kramat Iqbal is still with us. I know you've agreed to take some questions, so we'll open the lines. If you're a taxi driver and experience this abuse, you want to share your experiences, you can do so anonymously. Let's open the line 01 924 231 We think they are low, low human beings and, and are easy prey. Uh, for our bad attitudes. If we're feeling, uh, you know, uh, in a bad mood, we, we take it out on a um, taxi driver. And um, we also know, uh, uh, passengers also know that the abuse is not being recorded, not being watched. That's why my report is called When Nobody's Looking. And so these are some of the reasons that set the drivers up as vulnerable uh, people to abuse and also uh, maybe encourage the passengers to do it because they know uh, nobody's going to um, uh, see it. Nobody's going to do anything about it. And you so made... we, we have a very wrong attitude where cust we, we think customer is always right, uh, including when customer is not right. And these are the situations where customer is not right to, they don't have a right to abuse somebody. Yeah. And you've made some recommendations in the report. Can you tell us what those recommendations are, please, sir? I want the licensing authorities to take this matter very seriously, uh, appoint support officers, link officers. There should be a, a national offender register. We have, uh, when, when you are caught speeding, we are sent on speed awareness courses. I think it would make sense to put, turn, uh, refer people to um, attend racism awareness courses if they're caught abusing somebody. And finally, I would say we need to install cameras in all cars so that any abuse is recorded and then it provides the evidence to the police and the, and the authorities. And I think, let's face it, these drivers are out and about. They also have a positive role to play mm. in terms of eyes and ears of our society. And you know, we, we, when, when the Manchester Arena attacks happened, it was found that the taxi drivers were some of the first people on the scene. Yeah. And there are many situations where taxi drivers mm -hmm. see situations, see issues and problems long before the police do. Yeah. I, I, remember, I remember the, sorry, the Manchester uh, Arena attack that you referred to. And I remember talking to a family um, who were from Stoke-on-Trent uh, who had lost their wallet, they lost their phone, and there was no way of them getting in touch with their family. Um, and this taxi driver drove them to their home. And as the, the father came out to give the taxi driver the money for the fare, uh, he refused to accept it. Yes. He, he did a good deed. And that's one example I know of, but there's lots and lots of examples of taxi drivers who... Uh, may get a bad press, but are also good citizens. And we've seen that in this pandemic as they've been key workers on the front line, keeping the country going. Yeah, I think we, 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 we should professionalise uh, the taxi driver trade. Uh, and by, what I, by that, I mean, uh, it should be, they should be treated with respect. They should be trained, um, induction training, ongoing training. Um, they should be supported, respected as uh, people who are out and about and are eyes and ears. 
they are people who kept our society going. They they should be treated as key workers. Yeah. Because yeah. remember, they were there to support and transport the key workers during COVID. Yeah. And we owe them a, a debt of gratitude. We do. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the main thing is that they have to be protected like any other worker. We wouldn't tolerate abuse they experienced yeah. in many other situations. Because that's what I find shocking, uh, Dr. Kramat Iqbal, is that we would not accept that racist abuse in other industries. Like we've seen recently in football in the Euro uh, final where black players uh, were racially abused. Whether it's here in the media uh, or other industries, we would... We wouldn't accept it as a society. But if you, but for working class taxi drivers, it's ignored by authorities, isn't it? It is. And we, we saw uh, the, the person whose abuse I had seen on the TV, um, with that, if, if that hadn't been recorded, a bit like, um, you know, George Floyd's murder, mm. there had been other murders, but his murder had an impact because it was recorded. That is why I'm arguing that there should be a recording in, fitted in all taxis to keep these vulnerable drivers safe from abuse. And who, who, would, pick that, who would pick up the cost of that? Cameras in taxis uh, is something which many local authorities, we had the uh, president of the Wakefield Drivers Association here in Wakefield, who was arguing that that was an additional cost which the drivers couldn't afford. Who picks up that cost? Are you, are you saying that the local authority does that? I, I would actually uh, uh, make a case that the licensing authorities, they, they make enough money from, uh, from the drivers. Uh, the licensing authorities should pick up the tab and it is their duty to protect what I would call a sort of an employee. It is a contract between the driver and the local authorities. And I think the local authorities are there to serve the public, serve the communities. That includes the drivers. I think the local authorities should provide the the cost necessary to provide cameras in cars. You could you could potentially argue that you could get it at a discount. You know, if yes, there's a local authority, yes. I don't know, five thousand, six thousand taxi drivers who need cameras being installed, uh, you could uh, you could get a discount on it, and so it'd be relatively cheaper than it might be on the main uh, on the main market. But above all, I think we as a society need to start a conversation. We need to take this matter seriously and um, protect the drivers because the racism they experience, we don't tolerate it anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely right, yeah. So why should we tolerate every time a driver go, leaves yeah. home and gets in his car, why should he expect to be abused? Yeah, um, we are coming towards the end of the programme and I've got a couple of more questions. One is, what has the reaction been from the government or the local authorities, the councils, licensing departments to your report and research? Well, it's been lukewarm. I think um, uh, I, I've tried to engage some local authorities, some councillors, um, but I, th I think until the report is taken seriously and government and local authorities take this matter seriously and do something about it, nothing is going to happen. It's just a report and, you know, it's, it's, it's going to decorate somebody's shelf. Yeah, that's the really important thing uh, that we want to see in the, of substance. Now, uh, you've done so much research. I wanted to talk to you about your book on Trojan Horse. Uh, that you did in Birmingham. Maybe we can get you back on uh, to talk about that. Now, I suppose my final question is, if you was, well, you are, you're making a recommendation for a book that people can read over the summer. 
what would your recommendation be to our viewers? I, I have about half a dozen books on the go. I wouldn't pick one book. What I would say is everybody should always be reading a book, at least one book. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be about a hobby, could be about politics, could be somebody's life story. I have just finished, literally, one book that I have just finished today was Agent Sonia, and it was about a real-life German Jew who became a spy for Russia. Russia. And um, she actually ended up in Britain as well, lived in Oxford, and was spying. And the a most interesting yeah. story. But as I said, it, read something else. Okay. Read about education. Yeah. Read about well, some social issues. Thank you. But always, always be reading. Well, yeah, absolutely. So I'm really glad we've got the recommendation from you. Agent Sonia is the book. Um, yeah, if you want to read about it, there are many other books available, but this is the choice uh, of our guest, Dr. Karamat Iqbal. Thank you so much, sir. Let's uh, look forward to welcoming you, you back. read my book. Yeah, and don't forget to read the book. Uh, we'll maybe get you back to talk about the Trojan horse uh, when you uh, can fit us in, in your busy schedule. Thank you so right. much uh, for joining us and providing some very important insight and leadership, and I know many will appreciate that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, sir. Well, God bless you and all, all that you. you do. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, fantastic, really powerful interview there by Dr. Karamat uh, Iqbal uh, from Birmingham. Uh, joining us, he's from Forward Partnership. We've reached the end of the programme, uh, which means we've got 60 seconds left. But I just let me tell you what's coming up next week. We're not here because there's a charity appeal. Um, so we're having a break next week, but uh, we will be back the week after, which is the 25th of August. We'll be back at the same time of 8.30. Now, as a result of what's happening in this red list, we thought it'd be great to get the Consulate General uh, of Pakistan, um, Tariq Aziz, as our special guest. He'll be our special guest. Um, thank you to my guest, Kamran Hussain, and Dr. Karamat Iqbal there uh, tonight. But as I said, we'll be back uh, on Wednesday, the 25th of August, at the time of 8.30 and we'll have Tariq Wazir. Thank you so much to the team behind the scenes who make this show what it is. I hope you enjoy it as much as I absolutely love presenting it. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic week. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.